History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 2, Universal in Particular, November 12, 1964. Last time I talked to you about the philosophy of history. I should like to continue today by saying something about history as an academic discipline. In the course of this lecture, I shall perhaps be able to go some way towards persuading you that, objectively, history is possible only as the philosophy of history, a view that is not wholly without foundation. Moreover, any history, historiography, that denies this is simply unaware of itself and its own requirements. Now what I have re represented to you as a crisis in the idea of historical meaning can be seen in the postulates of historiography, and beyond that, in the majority of the humanities, which especially in Germany are predominantly historical in their methods, and which resist every attempt to oppose that historical orientation. Let me remind you of the dominant positivist tradition in historiography, which was first formulated in Ranke's dictum that the task of history, of historical research, was to tell how it really happened. The effect of this tradition was that increasingly it involved the outlawing of every attempt to understand history from above, and this meant the elimination of every element of history, every objective historical tendency, which I claimed last time was not derivative or secondary, was not merely the weird invention of philosophers of history, but was in fact what people immediately experience when they find themselves caught up in a maelstrom of the so-called great historical epochs. If I am not mistaken, the tendency of historians is increasingly to call into question all large concepts, such as that of universal history itself, and then likewise to cast doubt, firstly, on the idea of the great trends that are supposed to be at work throughout history, and finally, on narrower concepts such as those of the different epochs. I need only remind you of the fact, well known to the historians among you, that the concept of the Middle Ages has, with every good reason, been undermined in a variety of ways. One line of argument has been to maintain that the crisis in the Middle Ages should probably be dated much earlier than the official start to the Renaissance. Scholars began to talk about the discovery of a kind of proto-Renaissance as early as the age of High Gothic a period traditionally assigned to the Middle Ages. By way of contrast, there are other trends that challenge the concept of historical facts as such, so that the undermining of historiography even extends to its own opposite pole. The concept of the individual historical event, the événement. In France, above all, critical historians have attacked even événementisme, as an approach in which too much importance is attributed to major particular events. You may well be familiar with this yourselves if you have ever wondered whether the great battles of Napoleon or the great elector really were as important historically as people said they were. This overweighting of the factual itself presupposes a theory that historical processes have some sort of meaning which then identifies its nodal points or crises in such and the, and the moment the idea of such a meaningful historical process is shaken, it begins to have an effect upon the counter idea of the specific fact so that history begins to slide almost imperceptibly to a point where it becomes questionable whether we can say anything meaningful about it at all. In these lectures, I wish to deal only with one specific problem of history, namely the relation between the universal the universal tendency and the particular, that is, the individual. It is not my task here to enter into the detail of the way in which history is constructed. Even so, I believe that if we are to treat certain fundamental questions of the philosophy of history, we cannot ignore such matters entirely. And I believe further that the knowledge of historical matters is in the first instance a question of distance. If we approach details too closely and fail to open them up to critical inspection, we will indeed find ourselves in the proverbial situation of not seeing the wood for the trees. On the other hand, if we distance ourselves too much, 
we shall be unable to grasp history because the categories we use themselves we use themselves become excessively magnified to the point where they become problematic and fail to do justice to their material. I have in mind concepts such as the progress of freedom, about which I offered some critical comments last time. So I would say that we need to keep a certain distance. This will enable us both to dissociate ourselves from a total theory of history and equally to resist the cult of the facts, which, as I have explained, have their own conceptual difficulties. We can illustrate this by saying, for example, that we cannot really speak of something like progress in general, as indeed I have already argued. Incidentally, we shall take a closer look at this concept towards the end of the section in which we discuss the philosophy of history. But you should also be aware that there is always something dubious about the talk of individual examples of progress that have allegedly occurred in the course of history. This is because in the society in which we live, every single progressive act is always brought about at the expense of individuals or groups who are thereby condemned to fall under the wheels. Thus, because of their particularity, because they disregard the organization of society as a whole, each of these progressive events means that there are always groups who are their victims and who legitimately doubt their value. Nevertheless, we may say, and I believe that even the severest critic of history would not simply dismiss this view, that we can speak of something like progress from the slingshot to the atom bomb. It is not by chance that I am willing to apply the concept of progress to something as terrifying as the atom bomb, something that is so completely inimical to the progress of freedom, to the advance of the autonomy of the human species. There's a good reason for this, or rather it has a very bad and indeed catastrophic meaning. The fact is that particularity will be the mark of all historical movements, as long as there is no such thing as what we might call a human race. That is to say, a society that is conscious of itself and has its fate in its own hands. As long as that remains true, all progress will be particular, not just in the sense that progress will always come about at the expense of groups who are not directly involved in it and who have to bear the brunt of progressive changes, but in the sense that progress has a particular character by nature. I believe that a thinker such as Max Weber displayed a very proper instinct for this when he deserved the concept of progress for rationality. Max Weber was of course a positivist thinker through and through, even though it was a German version of positivism, one that had passed through the sieve of critical philosophy. He postulated something like a universal structure of progressive rationality, at least as a perspective for humanity as a whole. To be sure, he exercised great caution in so doing, since he accepted that there were entire civilizations that were prevented by their traditionalist economies from sharing in this progressive rationality and its associated social dynamic. It will astonish you to hear me speaking of a progressive rationality immediately after talking about particularity in the evolution of the historical totality, since you might well imagine that, because reason is a preeminently universal category, for it to prevail would, re would represent the polar opposite of any such particularity. However, I think it a mistake to conceive of this idea of a progressive rationality as something incompatible with particularity. I believe that if we are able to appreciate the particularity of the universal, in this instance of progressive rationality, we shall understand a little about the dialectics of the universal and the particular as a structure of history. This is because the universal principle contains a particular within it as a bad negative element. Um, and in this way, and in the same way, the converse too holds good, as Hegel has shown with irresistible force. Namely, that the particular, the individual facts, embody the power of the universal in concentrated form. For, from the very outset, the rationality to which we commonly ascribe universality was a rationality of the domination of nature, the control of both external nature and man's inner nature. I should like to refer you here to The Dialectic of Enlightenment by Horkheimer and myself, a book that at long last is due to appear again in the foreseeable future. This domination of nature was not self-reflective, but asserted its control over its so-called materials by subsuming, classifying, subordinating, and otherwise cutting them short. 
By materials here, we include the materials of nature, the human beings that are to be dominated, and even the subjection of one's own inner nature to the process of rationality. And this contains an idea that I think you should bear in mind, since I believe that it is of key importance for our argument. It is the idea that the principle I have called the universal principle, the principle of progressive rationality, contains an internal conflict. In other words, this kind of rationality exists only insofar as it can subjugate something different from and alien to itself. We can put it even more strongly. It can exist only by identifying everything that is caught up in its machinery, by leveling it, and by defining it in its alterity as something that resists it. And we may even go so far as to say something that is hostile to it. In other words, then antagonism, conflict, is in fact postulated in this principle of dominant universality, of unreflecting rationality, in precisely the same way as antagonism to, sub to a subservient group is postulated in a system of rule. And the stage at which self-awareness might lead this rationality to bring about change, that stage has still not been reached. I should like to say more about this proposition that will probably seem to many of you to be wildly speculative, a piece of pure Hegelian idealism. Perhaps I can turn it the right way up so that it may appear a bit more plausible to you. But, but before doing so, I should like to add something in honor of the concept of universal history, even though I remain of the view that this concept too must be understood dialectically. By this I mean that we can say neither that there is such a thing as universal history, nor, as is the general fashion today, that there is no such thing. Instead, instead, we shall have to say, and this is implicit, and when I've already told you that universal history exists precisely to the same degree as the principle of particularity, or as I now prefer to call it, the principle of antagonism persists and perpetuates itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not want to present you with such high sounding declarations without linking them to materials that will help to illuminate, illuminate them for you. This is particularly important, I believe, at the start of these lectures. At the same time, I do not wish to venture into the territory of what goes by the notion of examples, something to which I have the gravest objections for a variety of philosophical reasons. I come back once again to Spengler, who was adamant in his hostility to such universalist theories of history, and especially to such notions of a progressive rationality. In contrast, he advocated a theory, one which was very striking in many individual details, of self-contained cultures that occurred simultaneously, that is to say that succeeded one another and were nevertheless simultaneous. And he defended this theory until he was blue in the face. We may not have enough time or space to explain just how this simultan simultaneity is to be understood. However, I believe that it is explicable without our having to have recourse to Spengler's own morphological hypothesis. One idea that he advances is the theory that Western technology, which he calls Faustian, was alien to the Russian soul and the East Asian soul in general. It follows that it is simply inconceivable that the Japanese, for example, might be able to appropriate this technology for themselves. Well, as things have turned out, Max Weber's prognosis has been fully vindicated. We have seen how technology has succeeded in sweeping across the frontiers of the different national souls, if such things exist, and it has done so simply by virtue of its own objectivity, its own inherent laws. You will all be aware that the Japanese came within an ace of destroying the American fleet in the last war, thanks to their technically advanced use of air power. And you will also know that today the Russians have become the Americans' keenest competitors in the most modern branches of technology. You can see something of a convergence towards a kind of universal standard at the level of technical rationality. And this is particularly marked in countries which had previously been excluded from what Germans think of as the pole of universal history. You only have to travel abroad a little to see the uniformity of the airports and compare them with the differences between cities that lie 
far apart from one another. These differences then seem to have an anachronistic air, almost like that of a fancy dress ball. Once you experience this, it takes little to convince yourself of the power of this trend towards universal history. To this extent, there does seem to be an element of truth in the much criticized idea of universal history, at least in terms of its telos. And doubtless, this element of truth can be traced back to periods in which such a universalist element did not yet exist at least not one implicit in the processes indispensable for the reproduction of life and the social formations contained in them or in the forms taken by the forces of production. I shall now come to the question that I put to you earlier and that really cannot be sidestepped now. The question is whether this process of progressive rationality has to be seen as an absolute. I should say that this question is particularly important in the context of the discussions in the dialectic of enlightenment. This would not involve denying that there are great countervailing tendencies. The existence of outbursts of the irrational is not in dispute. Only we must qualify this by noting that the so-called outbreaks of irrational or primitive forces in our own age have almost always been the product of manipulation. They have almost always appeared in the service of domination, rational or irrational domination, and must be understood, therefore, as integral to the growth of the techniques of rational domination. Needless to say, this can be seen with especial clarity in the case of National Socialism, if you still have the heart to study that phenomenon. But I have something different in mind. What I have said does not imply that we are bound to ascribe this tendency of which I am speaking to spirit as the agent of rationality in the abstract, as was the case in the idealist philosophies. And I should like at this point to pay my respects to Hegel. Although Hegel talks constantly of spirit, the principle of the identity of subject and object ensures that this concept is organized from the outset in such a way that it remains distinct from what people thought of as spirit later on in the 19th century, and indeed in our own day, where it is generally defined as purely subjective thought. In Hegel's philosophy, Thanks to a powerful theory, however open to question it may have been in certain respects, spirit embraces the entire realm of the historical, political, and economic life of mankind. In Hegel's system, spirit is assigned a specific place in the real historical world. Hegel would have vehemently repudiated the idea of spirit as a free-floating thing distinct from its opposite, the material life of mankind. Dilthey's concept on the of the humanities and everything connected with it regarded itself in a sense as Hegel's heir. However, this is an utter misunderstanding and a lapse beneath the level of the discussion that had been attained in Hegel himself. But this is, by the way, um, but this is, by the way, the sentence stops there. It seems wrong, but the important point here is that you should not think of the spirit of which I am speaking as something absolutely autonomous. It is true that the spirit has made itself independent, and it is equally true that through, sorry, through its potent instruments, logic and mathematics, it has freed itself from the conditions that brought it forth. Because of the division of labor into mental and manual work, Spirit even appears to itself as something absolute and autonomous, as a method that includes its opposite within itself. But we should not buy into this view of spirit. The evolution of spirit as rationality, as the reason that dominates nature, or as what I have called technical rationality, in other words, the evolution of the technical forces of production in toto, is the product of the material needs of human beings, of what they need for their preservation. And the categories of the spirit constantly and necessarily contain these needs as the necessary elements of their form. Spirit is the product of human beings and of the human labor process, just as much as it informs and ultimately dominates human labor processes as a method, as technical rationality. It is vital that we should not hypostasize the concept of spirit, but that we should instead see it in its dependence upon a concept of life upon the need to help sustain the human life in which it has its roots.
Only if we do this will we be able to understand how spirit in the shape of technical rationality could have contrived to achieve such a unifying control over the life of mankind, as has increasingly been the case. Spirit is no absolute first thing. The postulate that spirit is primary is an illusion, an illusion created and necessarily created by itself. But by the same token, it is something produced by the reality of a life bent on self-preservation, something that postulates itself as primary only so that it may criticize existing reality or gain control over it. I spoke earlier of the absence of self-reflection on the part of spirit and of technical rationality, an absence of reflection that had the unfortunate consequence of forcing reason into a strange and paradoxical relationship with blind historical fate. But this was caused not least by the fact that spirit misconceives itself as primary instead of perceiving its interconnectedness with actual life. The growth of rationality is something like the growing ability of the human species to preserve itself, or as we may also say, the growth in the universal principle of the human self. And the progress of this rationality in its unreflective form is at bottom nothing other than the exploitation of nature transferred to men and continuing to work in them. However, Insofar as it is this exploitation, and insofar as it is bound up with such concepts as exploitation, as well as with what is opposed to it and subjugated by it, this progressive reason harbors within itself an element of self-destruction. I told you about this last time when I attempted to portray the experience of the course of history as it is available to us in the here and now, as in essence the experience of its negativity. That is to say, is the experience of the way in which we are impotently dragged along in its wake. In other words, then, this progressive instrumental reason is the embodiment of the antagonism that consists in the relation between the supposedly free human subject, who for that very reason is in fact not yet free at all, and the things on which his freedom is built. The antagonistic character of progressive rationality is the aspect of it that turns the universal, the universal that is in the process of asserting itself, into the particular which causes such anguish to us who are likewise particulars. And this will perhaps resolve the contradiction, I mean theoretically, not in actuality, and not even resolve it in theory, but at least throw some light on it. The contradiction of which I spoke earlier when I told you how paradoxical it, it appears at first sight for the universality of the historical principle, which is supposed to be continuing and progressing, and to be growing in strength, to be identical with blind fate. But if the enlightening principle of reason fails to become transparent to itself, if it fails to perceive its dependence on what is different from itself, it inevitably becomes transformed into the very fate that it thinks of as its own antithesis. This is the blind spot that acts as a jinx on the entire historical dimension of Hegelian philosophy. It brings me to the main difficulty of every theory of history for the pre-critical consciousness which forms my starting point. I may remind you that I have already formulated this and would ask you to be aware that in our discussions we have indeed gained this insight by saying that in this pre-critical consciousness the dominant prevailing universality can no longer be equated with the meaning of history or indeed with any positive value. This is indeed the difficulty to which almost every form of consciousness, every naive form of consciousness, finds itself exposed. The danger of regarding as justified the, the supremacy of an objective power over human beings, who always believe that they are in full possession of themselves, and because of their certainty on this point, are highly, are highly reluctant to admit the degree to which they are merely the functions of some universal. For the moment, they were to concede that they would, in a sense, cease to be in their own eyes what their whole tradition tells them they are. This is a great paradox, and I should like to encourage you to reflect upon it. On the one hand, the fact is, and I believe that I said enough about this last time, that our most immediate experience is that we are all harnessed to an objective trend, and it is hard to disabuse us of this. We may think, for example, of the situation of someone who is being persecuted, a typical fate in our time, who is being discriminated against and possibly exposed to liquidation because he is said to possess some characteristic or other that he doesn't even need. 
Or we may think of the much more harmless situation of someone who is looking for a job and who at the very moment he hopes to find one that meets his own requirements and abilities turns out to be biting on granite even in this age of glorious full employment and ends up having to do something that is not at all to his liking. Such experiences, I would say, are absolutely fundamental. If there is any immediate experience, this is it. On the other hand, however, the moment you draw attention to this, the sciences, donning their full academic robes, so to speak, ask you what actually gives you the right to assume the existence of something universal. This universal is a metaphysical principle. It exists only in our mind, or only in your mind. Not mine, just yours. In reality, there is nothing but spontaneous individual phenomena, the individual acts of individual human beings. And this universal is no more than an idea you have let others foist on you. Nowadays, there really is something like a perversion of consciousness, a reversing of what is primar primary and what's, and what's secondary, which goes so far that, for purely epistemological reasons that have by now become automatic, we let ourselves be talked out of everything we experience at any given moment as the, the determining forces in our lives, and we are taught to regard them instead as a metaphysical sleight of hand. And in contrast to this, things that are really questionable, such as the primary character of individual human reactions, are treated by this so-called scientific mind as if they were truly primary and an absolutely secure foundation of knowledge, simply because they are supposed to be the basis of all our judgments. I believe that we would do well to obtain some clarity about this web of delusion if we were to have any hope at all, of, if not acquiring a firm basis for our understanding of history, at least clearing a path towards it. And having seen through this web of delusion, we shall perhaps find it easier to think of the concept of universality as negativity, a concept I shall turn to next time.